Um, this second part after breastfeeding and the third part you're going to have, uh, try to condensate uh, uh, courses that we give uh, during masters during uh, three to five days uh, or during uh, whole afternoons when it's uh, an intensive. And here you try, we were trying to make the most of uh, four hours. So uh, if I'm going too fast, you, you let me know, OK? Uh, so now I'm going to talk about the cause and consequence of malnutrition in emergencies. We're going to do a quick overview of nutrition, malnutrition. Sometimes we uh, use the two terms also to uh, understand uh, malnutrition in children. I'm kind of biased toward children and key concepts of malnutrition emergencies and bas basic concepts of acute malnutrition management. And then we're going to see uh, the last part, strategies. What should you do to understand when you go into a nutrition project, uh, uh, the different type of projects that we have? So nutrition is a broad term. You can look for it, no? And it involves eating, digestion, using how the way we use food for growth and development, and etc. But malnutrition normally should include under and overnutrition. And sometimes we use malnutrition only for undernutrition, no? And uh, and undernutrition, which is the term that we should use more, also includes several things like acute malnutrition, chronic, and also micronutrient deficiencies. Okay, so you could be uh, anemic and you will be undernourished. Um, and in emergency, the focus is typically what we call acute malnutrition. Uh, also, terms that uh, it's important for you to know basic difference: malnutrition is imbalanced, unbalanced diet. No, you're lacking some of, or you have excess or, or wrong proportions uh, of, uh, of some nutrients. You can have under, obesity, or macronutrient deficiency. You could have a situation of famine. Famine is a, a, a more of a lack of food in the, uh, and there's presence of uh, hunger and starvation in all age groups normally. And there's an increase in mortality. So we're gonna see in the last part when do you say we're in a situation of famine? And starvation is a characteristic of some people that don't have enough food to eat. Okay? It requ it, it, it's about the person that doesn't have enough to eat uh, itself. It's not that there is not enough food in the population. No? We're going to talk about food security also. And also, I talk about, a, about the vulnerability. Depends on the system. Normally, you would say always the under five. The pregnant and lactating because they have specific extra requirement, but also think about the others: disabled, elderly, sick, teenagers, and check also. Uh, you could be a, a young, healthy, not even a teenager in your 20s or 30s, and check uh, how many dependents do you have. Uh, if you are single or child-headed, uh, any other chronic disease. Oh, sorry. Uh, classic conceptual model of malnutrition. Uh, Normally, it's always a social problem. Infrastructure, context, the resources, the potential resources. And then it goes into three big branches. A problem at a household of food security in the community. A problem in the environment, for example, or the care environment, or a problem in the public health system. And that creates a loop where there is uh, increasing disease on one side, or reduction in the food available on the other side. One can be or the other. In many places, uh, the classic ones that we see was you know, the lack of food, but also an increase in, disease, in diseases. Uh, remember that uh, once you are sick, you are not hungry anymore. So you have a higher risk of, of, uh, of losing weight. And then uh, you're sick again. You're not hungry. And then you enter into the loop. Um, just uh, an important idea to have in mind. Also, remember that any change into a child's environment caused by displacement, exposure to, uh, expose the child to a, a large risk of malnutrition. As here, when I refer to malnutrition, I'm going to say uh, is undernutrition. So any change, any significant change in the quantity of quality of the food or limit access to it, it's going to weaken the food security. And there is a list of vulnerability. Like if the child is separated from the parents, the 
think of the developmental stage of the child. Think of, uh, of how he can access to healthcare, uh, how he can access to, to specific nutritional needs, uh, and the living conditions, and the previous health conditions. Uh, and ideally, when we thought about vulnerability of kids, we were thinking of small kids because they were dependent on adults, they were more susceptible to disease, their immune system is changing and adapting, and what we saw this morning, lack and insufficient breastfeeding. So the, if you would analyze where does the people that are being refugee now coming from and how strong the, 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 the practice of breastfeeding, that's or, or already going to be a, a resilient factor for, for them to, to support. Um, the global burden of malnutrition gives you an idea. Sometimes big numbers are hard to, to, to seize or grasp. We're talking about 165 million children with chronic malnutrition, uh, with wasting uh, 52 million, and with severe acute malnutrition around 20 million. The numbers are going down even if the population is increasing, but when you try to compare these numbers with the number of projects that there are in the world, we're still uh, not able to reach most of them. And of course, again, if you see um, a map of the world, you still see more or less the same, uh, the same list of places, uh, Sub-Saharan, Central and East Africa, and, and West Africa in the coasts. You can see it also India, uh, and as a country having such a large population, uh, it goes for most of the malnourished are in India, close to half of them. Actually, if you would take the ones that I point out, for example, uh, Pakistan, uh, also Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar, or India, and you, you add, for example, Nigeria, you, you, you would have most of the malnourished. Uh, remember that is a, is a critical interaction, no? Like sometimes uh, it seems that the solution is only in the food, and sometimes it's about breaking the, the, the link with some of the of critical disease, like diarrhea, respiratory tract infection, measles and malaria are specific diseases that, that have uh, a key uh, interaction with some uh, uh, nutrient deficiencies that are causing them, or actually uh, they're causing some specific nutrient deficiencies. Um, I'm not going to go into details. I'm going to give you all the slides so you go deep, and I'm going to give you key documents to read, to, to read uh, more about it. And uh, most of the topic is about r remembering that emergencies do not happen in a vacuum. They can have long-term consequences on nutrition and development. And uh, it's important to learn from past emergencies, so that's why we're here. Uh, nutrition, now we have managed to put nutrition as one of the core components. But it wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, so uh, important before. It looks like uh, it's obvious, but if you look uh, just uh, 30 years ago, it wasn't like that. Um, and malnutrition may be the primary feature of an emergency. And what was going to be very interesting that I'm going to present you is that you, you could use some indicators, and they, they give you a big uh, analysis of the situation. Like when we talk about the crude mortality rate, also, the malnutrition rates are one of those very good proxy indicators of the general situation of the population. Uh, and we're going to see some difference between rapid onset emergencies or chronic uh, situations that are going to uh, evolve into emergencies. Normally, they're totally predictable. They're totally predictable. The situations like the Nepal, Katrina, let's say the a typhoon in the Philippines, this type of massive uh, disasters, uh, they're hard to predict, they're harder to predict, let's say, but the famines caused by the drought are, are like textbooks. You can really predict them, uh, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, and uh, normally, even if you can predict them with one or two years, always uh, the international community is very slow to respond. Um, we're going to talk about food security in the second part. I'm just going to here put some terms, availability, access, and use. Uh, availability is that you have food sources of adequate quality and quantity for the population at regional, national level. And access, it's that the household has the ability to produce, to buy or to receive the four sources. So you can have a lot of food in the market, 
but you don't have the money to buy it, you don't have access. There is availability, but you are the one that don't have access. Okay? And use is uh, that food that is obtained is used properly. You can have a lot of food, you can buy it, but if you don't know how to use it properly, maybe the way, for example, uh, manioc uh, consumption, if you don't know how to, to cook it properly, you can die, uh, you can, sorry, get sick of Konzo disease because uh, you do not cook it properly. Okay? Um, and food insecurity is a consequence, but it's also a contributor to malnutrition emergencies. It can, uh, uh, in violent conflicts, uh, if there's a reduction in the food production, if there is a destruction of, the, of some of the, of the land, of loss of crops and livestock, that, that, that seems to be kind of uh, easy to understand that you have less food available or uh, uh, you're going to have reduced investment in agricultural, health, etc. No? Uh, in disaster, it's the same. So uh, it's going to cause malnutrition, but not immediately. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some time. Uh, this is also the big uh, picture of uh, what is the part that has been affected on, on the your left side. The food chain, if it's a problem at the production level, distribution, at access, at consumption, at biological use, or in the nutritional status. You could be an affectation in different parts. Normally, it's a problem in the distribution or in a natural disaster at production level. Or sometimes, the roads have been cut off is a problem in, in, in access to the food. Uh, sometimes when we're going to talk about people very sick, the problem is going to be at the biological use of the food. And also different conflict and disaster are going to cause, for example, reduce or destruct production. At the households, there's going to be a redu reduce uh, resources. Uh, that's going to affect the living conditions. That's going to cause migration. Migration as the big term, no? Just di displacement. And uh, that's going to bring to decreased food consumption. That's going to increase the risk of disease. And that's going to affect the nutritional status. And there's different tools and there's different adaptations that we're going to see, no? New crops, changing the way we live, changing in the food prices, other types of, uh, of economies. Uh, you're going to go somewhere else. You're going to adapt your household structure. Uh, you're going to change what you eat. You were eating rice, now it's too expensive, you change to corn, depending on your cultural adaptability. And, uh, and that's going to cause, uh, either you adapt, either you're not, you're going to have uh, either acute or chronic malnutrition. Uh, we're going to see also more in detail, I'm going to go through this because I'm going to talk about it on the second part, about the seasonality, no? the link between the hunger period, the harvest, the rainfall, I'm going to go it on the second phase. Uh, so in refugee camps, there's always, uh, because they depend mostly on uh, the international community to fund them and the different clusters to fund the health part, the water and sanitation, there's normally there their, their funding shortage. Uh, sometimes uh, there is an aggregated natural disaster, not only drought, but uh, heavy rains or that destroy the crop. Um, there's civil conflicts. They, they, it's not uh, by, by, by mystery that they appear in places that ha have been environmentally uh, degraded. And um, so normally there is very uh, severe underfunding of the refugee programs. And also the delivery systems are inadequate, sometimes not reliable. Uh, the distribution is unequal. There's always mafias. Remember, every time you're in a refugee situation, there's going to be a local mafia. There's going to be a local mafia, and uh, you can trust wherever you want, but uh, you, you will see that the distribution of food that you did is not going to be evenly distributed. Part of the food that you have distributed for free just in the afternoon is in the market uh, and being sold, and the prices are different according to, to, to the, the access of the, of the population. So those are things that you need to, to check a lot. Uh, also, in refugee settings, you have a higher uh, proportion of uh, chronic uh, disease like HIV, malaria, and TB. And uh, the water supply is always a problem. Traditional foods are not available, so you're asking people to eat something that they're not used to, so sometimes they don't like it. And uh, just in addition to the psychological trauma, all the disruption that you may have, 
and all the cultural associations we, you have with food. Food is so important because it's not only something that you need, but it's also something that brings people together. So uh, it's a very sensitive issue. Um, and uh, you might be in a place uh, where you have refugees from different communities and they have different eating habits, but you need to have a more or less standard type of food that you're giving. Some are gonna like it, some are not gonna like it. So they're gonna, this is normal, you're gonna receive corn, but you don't like it because you like rice. So you're gonna have it and you're gonna resell it to get your rice. But for the same amount of corn, you're getting maybe two thirds of the amount of rice. So you're eating less. And we have calculated perfectly your ration based on the corn, but not on the, on the price of the rice. So at the end, refugees are unable sometimes to obtain the adequate micronutrients and the energy requires for proper functioning. You tell them, you need to eat 2,100 kilocalories. And uh, they're going to eat what they, what, they, what, they, what they think is correct for them also. Uh, and we're going to see in details the two key uh, manifestations that we see. In weight loss, we see marasmic kids, kwashiorkor kids. It's very rare to see kwashiorkor in adults. Extremely, extremely rare. Uh, so it's almost a pediatric condition. But marasmus, it's very frequent to see it in, uh, in, uh, in adults too, unfortunately. And it shows directly that you have a severe situation. Macronutrient deficiency, the most common one is iron. Then vitamin A, iodine also. Less common are specific like vitamin C, niacin, thiamine, riboflavin, vitamin D. In the general population, I've been doing recent studies on thiamine uh, uh, deficiency proportion in the malnourished. And in the malnourished, it could be up to two thirds of the severely acute malnourished. But in the general population, normally, it's, uh, it's rare. Uh, so whether an individual gets enough food to eat or whether he or she is at risk of infection is going to be mainly the result of factors operating at household and community level, the causes. Uh, we know that. And uh, what is very sad sometimes is we don't want to intervene in the cause. We, we, we just deal with the consequences. So uh, it's kind of a, of a cynical approach, let's say, or very... We're going to just deal with the consequences. We're not going to deal. We know already that the problem you have here in Somalia or in Kenya, it's speculation over the prices of the crops every year. But we're not going to intervene at that stage. We're just going to intervene uh, with the dying people at the end. Uh, so normally it's always related to food insecurity, social care environment, or the public health system. And. Um, how do you define it? This is important because uh, uh, we use anthropometric indicators. Uh, some, uh, it's what we call the weight for height. Uh, the weight for height, you would measure the, the proportion, the, the relationship between the, the weight and the height, and you take normality curves, bell curves of the population, and the far away you are from, from the center, from the norm, the more you are malnourished. So if you are, uh, below uh, two standard deviations from the norm, uh, but you are above three standard deviations below from the norm, you're in moderate acute malnutrition. If you're below three standard deviations from the norm, you are classified as being severely acute malnourished. And uh, global acute malnutrition, if you want to retain something, this is that. Global acute malnutrition is the sum of the severe acute malnourished plus the moderate acute malnourished. And the global acute malnutrition is going to be your indicator. If you need two things when you got into a refugee settings, you ask for the crude mortality rate and you ask for the global acute malnutrition rate. That already gives you your proxy of the situation. Uh, the problem is that the crude mortality rate, you need some kind of a survey. And for the global acute malnutrition, you require also a, 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 another survey. And that this one is, uh, if it's not done properly, you would totally overestimate or underestimate the, the situation. Doing the weight for height, like if you have measure kits, is not that easy. Uh, and if you have to do it to an entire group of people or even to a small sample of that, it requires time and it requires some of the training to put the head and the knees and all of that. 
and uh, you know that if you make a mistake, you're going to make a big mistake in, in the measurement of the height of the child. And that's going to really make the difference if you classify a child to be severely malnourished or moderate malnourished. Um, so one thing that was observed that is kind of uh, interesting is uh, the middle upper arm circumference. When you measure uh, the middle upper arm circumference of the non-dominant arm of a kid, uh, from six months to five years, it is very interesting that it, is very, it, it, follow, it doesn't uh, change a lot and it's reflective of the nutritional status of the child. There are some um, uh, attempts to also put some middle upper arm standard values for uh, older children and even for adults, but they're not reliable. And as soon as they start to have a clear dominant hand or do exercise or stuff, it does change a lot. But for children below five, it's really, really good. And it's very easy to do. And uh, we've been doing studies for the past uh, five years to try to prove that it's actually as good as doing the weight for height, which is the gold standard today for WHO. So for example, for action against hunger and doctors without borders, right now we're switching to middle upper arm <laughs> as our main uh, standard, not only for screening, but also for uh, in a program when, uh, to follow up a child in a malnourished uh, program. Uh, so this is what I told you. In all the groups, we have different measures that I'm going to give you that uh, for older children, for adults, and for pregnant uh, and lactating women. How do you measure? You can have that information. And this is how you do the, the middle upper arm. Um, also, of course, if you see a child that, has a, that really looks emaciated, he doesn't have appetite, he's apathic, and he really looks sick, he, he's going to be admitted to the hospital. Also, if you have a kid that doesn't fit your, your anthropometric indicators, but has a clinical sign like you're seeing, and he has a textbook case of beriberi, of course, you can classify it as malnourished. Um, if you have some time uh, rechecking the presentation, try to, to, to check these differences about a normal kid, a marasmus, a stunted, a stunted with marasmus and a quash in how it affects. For example, the normal kid, uh, if you have a, a marasmic kid, he would have a weight for the age reduced and also the weight for the height. But normally the marasmic, uh, the height for the age sometimes is conserved. If, he, if it's acute, it's going to be conserved. If he's stunted, let's say he's a chronic malnourished, the weight for the age would be reduced, but the weight for the height would be good. He'll be just small. And the height for the age would be reduced, OK? So be the smaller of the class. Uh, but you have sometimes, in most of these places, is a situation where these kids are exposed <coughs> to several episodes of, of, uh, of, um, of food uh, insecurity. So they are chronically malnourished and also acutely malnourished. So they're going to be low for their age. Uh, so, um, they're going to be uh, with a weight reduced for their age, also for their height. And uh, also, the height is going to be lower for the age. The quashure core are tricky because it can appear in a matter of weeks. In a matter of weeks. So sometimes, if you would measure them uh, first, because they're edematous, the, the liquid that they have is going to completely uh, bias your estimation of the weight for the age or the weight for the height. And uh, sometimes the height for the age, if it's in a place where there's chronic malnutrition, is going to be reduced, but sometimes it's going to be normal. So you have to be based on other indicators. For example, the color of the hair, uh, the, the nails, uh, the skin texture, other things. So this is a, this is a typical kid with a marasmic, marasmus. So he has low weight uh, for his height. Okay? So he has a severe weight loss, uh, and he has significant muscle atrophy. He looks like an old man, prominent bones, and sunken eyes. Uh, in some places, it is normal for people to have uh, or eyes that look like sunken. So, uh, and also dehydration also causes sunken eyes. The malnourished have already a lower total uh, circulatory fluid volume. So, um, so that increases the perception of, uh, of the sunken eyes. Marasmic kids. I always, I'm impressed by the marasmic because 
they have adapted. These guys have adapted. Uh, sometimes it can be four years and four kilos. And they, they, they have adapted to the situation. It's kind of impressive how they're in survival mode. So you need to be careful about, about how you're going to give them food back. The other type are the kwashiorkor. They just get swollen. These I think as the unadapted. They, they couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle it and so they went into a, a, a severe uh, metabolic instability. Why do we have quash or marasmus? We have no idea. You could read about it. The best uh, research that was done about physiopathology of the quash were done in the 70s and the 80s. Recently, you have a very interesting uh, debate between the old gurus of malnutrition in WHO and some uh, new uh, nephrologists that were publishing their studies uh, just this year about the cause of quash. But it's all intellectual discussion. It's like uh, just somebody saying, oh, marasmus, the big debate is, is this caused by protein deficiency? As doctors, you would say, okay, they're, they're puffy, they're having all the fluid in the interstitial, probably because there is a, a low protein, so the oncotic pressure in the intravascular pace goes down, so the fluid is leaking. That makes sense. But the, 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 the big uh, gurus of malnutrition say, no, 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 when we measure actually uh, that doesn't happen, and actually when you try to give extra protein, it doesn't change, and when you check the nutritional, uh, the food that they were eating, the ones that has quash do not seem to be eating less protein than the one that has marasmus. It's something else. So we don't know. Uh, what we know is that they have a higher risk of death, uh, and, uh, and that they have some level of hepatic uh, failure. Some of the... Of the, of the um, of the things that you would find is a uh, microbiome, uh, free radicals. Uh, there, there's a, a list of, of, uh, of reasons that I'm gonna, I put you a couple of articles on, on the reading um, folder. Uh, if somebody wants to do a research on this, please, uh, I'll be really interested. In, I mean, not only like conducting some, uh, there's two, uh, uh, ongoing research that Doxos We Borders is going to launch uh, this year on trying to measure everything on Quashorco kits to try to see what is going on. It's very hard to get significant numbers. Uh, the proportion of quash that you see in one place or the other changed a lot. And it also gets confused easily by other, uh, like nephrotic syndrome or other conditions that, call, that causes edema. It's not really clear what is Quashorco because sometimes it gets confused. There is also a push to try to consider it as a specific disease. And, uh, but in 2016, this is a disease that we cannot really, if you look at Wikipedia thing, they're not going to really tell you how it is a uh, cause or what it is. The term, just for the history, kwashoko is a Ghanaian uh, word that means the sickness the older <laughs> child gets when the new child is born. And I find it very interesting as a definition, no? So normally it goes for the first presentation we saw this morning. You had a child that was breastfed, and then he has a sibling, and the breastfeeding stops, and then this one gets sick. And it shows exactly what we were pointing out this morning. Um, the consequences of malnutrition are systemic, no? I'm not going to go into the details for you. Uh, it can cause everything, dysfunction of the kidney, of the liver, of the heart, of the thyroid, and I'll put the most important one, neurological damage. We we're discussing with, with Denise. It is urgent to solve it. By, by first year, you already have uh, severe neurological damage. By 24 months, it's going to be permanent. And then you can do whatever you want that kid is probably not going to be able, uh, you could have up to 70% loss of the IQ, which is really, really severe. So you could have somebody recovering completely physically and then unable to read and write. And that has severe public health consequences for these countries if you don't solve it uh, quickly. It's not only about mortality, it's about also uh, the long-term consequences of this. Uh, also, I'm not going to go into details of specific macronutrient deficiency and the risk factors. Um, 
I'm right now in, a, in an obsession of the vitamin B complex and um, uh, very interesting link and cofactors to the Krebs cycles that we think are being overlooked. Uh, most of the ready-to-use foods that we use now that we're going to see are including most of the nutrients. But if you look at also data about how much of these nutrients you should put in these ready-to-use food, there are no data. When you, when you check out the FDA, how much you should eat of any of these, they give you some recommendations. When you go into literature about what those recommendations were based on, all is coming from the 60s and the 70s. There are no studies about how much really you should eat. And what we're seeing now in the malnourished is that, for example, for some of the, vitamin, of the B complex uh, vitamins, we think that, it's, that we're giving 20 times less from what they would really require just to make their uh, Krebs cycle functions properly. So we're probably going to change all of that. This is a study uh, that was published this year in, the, um, uh, in a critical care medicine by Donino uh, Group. So this is high resource setting uh, critical care. They have all the vasopressors, ECMO, everything you want. And the, they show that they were measured time indeficiency at admission. They, uh, they found 35% in the US adult critical care population, non-alcoholics, they, 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 they took out the alcoholics, and 35% are time indeficient. These are not even severely acute malnourished. And uh, in the time indeficiency group, they gave time in to the time indeficient uh, so, sorry, they give time in and they show that in the time deficiency group there was a reduction uh, in the mortality, 13% versus 46% in a high resource settings with everything else. Uh, that was just published uh, uh, a month and a half, a couple of months ago, and we've been in contact with, the, with, uh, with Donino because uh, if this happens in a high resource settings with this level, uh, today you, don't, you, you cannot have this difference in mortality when you're trying to prove with any type of vasopressors or colloid versus crystal, it's very, very hard today to find this level of mortality reduction. So we want to do also a randomized controlled trial on timing administration in severely acute malnourished. The problem is the funding. We don't have right now uh, a lot of interest to do it because timing is so cheap that this is the type of things, all these micronutrients goes into the things that industry do not do a lot of research. And, uh, and uh, what we need is key research to know exactly what will be the amount of timing uh, that we should give uh, to, the, to the severely acute malnourished. Um, so this was a big revolution uh, in the 90s when all these ready-to-use foods were giving. Uh, everything the kid needs in just one pack. Uh, you were trying to prevent uh, to all the complications all the neurological sequela, reduce the mortality. It was easy to implement. You don't have to deal with the social problems. You don't have to deal with war, with politics. You just go there, you close your eyes about everything that is happening, and just give the food to the kids, and it was magic. And it worked. And now we think that uh, uh, that is not so simple. No? For example, the, the, the Indian government has has not authorized uh, any organization to import the, uh, this food. They, they, they don't want it because they know that these uh, destroy their, their way of coping with malnutrition. <laughs> no, they're having uh, community kitchens, trying to use locally produced foods, and this is just importing uh, uh, something to their places. So we're trying to say that, OK, OK, we agree. Let's just try to give it at least for the severely acute malnourished to reduce the mortality. This is the fight that we have right now. Uh, so we have different formulas, F75, F100. Uh, the idea is to um, <coughs> not give it too fast. Remember uh, what happened in the Second World War when all the people were getting out of the concentration camps and they were receiving food, they were just dying even more than before. So the people that were surviving, they were just dying when they were receiving the food. It was the first time more or less the refeeding syndrome uh, terms started to appear. So the idea when you have a severely acute malnourished is that you cannot give too much calories too fast. 
uh, the, the, the metabolism is not going to cope with it. Now we know even more that, for example, the, the timing calorie ratio should be respected. So you need to be very careful in the amount of calories that you give compared to the timing. If not, you're going to cause refeeding syndrome and the Krebs cycle collapse and it goes directly into lactic acidosis. So you need to stabilize and then restore the, uh, the electrolyte balance and prevent hypoglycemia and then go and transition into uh, rehabilitation and weight of gain. So normally we go into these three phases, stabilization, transition, and uh, rehabilitation. Now, uh, it used to be all at hospital level, uh, so it was a long phase. They would stay for many weeks. Now, the, the second part, the rehabilitation, it's been outsourced. Now we only stabilize them. As soon as they can eat solids, they're out. We're trying to uh, demedicalize the rehabilitation phase. That is when we're really giving calories uh, to facilitate rapid growth. Now there is also interesting uh, new research showing that all the trials that we're entering into our program, severely acute malnourished, we're making them weight gain fast in the rehabilitation phase. And now that we have the first cohorts of 20 years of people that are starting the programs in the 90s, we see that they have a higher rate of diabetes, hypertension, metabolic syndrome. And uh, well, that's very unfortunate. That apparently, the speed that we, were, uh, that we were causing the increase of that is causing other consequences that we had no idea when we started all of this. So uh, the problem is that would mean that we would need to go in this rehabilitation phase slower. But the slower you are in this rehabilitation phase, you still are at high risk of other infections and death. So that, that balance is uh, complicated to see. Um, we also give systematic treatment. So besides the nutrition, we give other drugs like amoxicillin, measles, vitamin A, folic acid, albendazole. The first one, very controversial. Also, large studies in the New England published by two groups, one by uh, Action Against Hunger group, um, Manari group, an excellent report about that amoxicillin in a large randomized controlled trial of more than 2,000 people, they show that amoxicillin does have an impact at reducing uh, mortality in the malnourished. The problem is that it means giving systematic antibiotics to all malnourished children. So any infectious disease will tell that this is crazy. This is really crazy in terms of uh, infection on, on antibiotic resistance. Uh, this is crazy. It has some basis because there is a lot of uh, bacterial overgrowth in the intestine of the kid. There is a misbalance at, at his microbiota level. So it seems like the, an the antibiotic is trying to, okay, wipe out everything. Let's just restart. And that seems to help. Um, but then it's, it's uh, in a place where you have high resistance to amoxicillin, it doesn't seem to work that well. And if we continue to use it like this, it's not going to work anymore. So recently, MSF just published another in the New England, so both are in the New England. Uh, another study with another 2,000 people randomized control trial showing that actually is not so significant, the reduction in mortality. And now there is a big fight between the two groups saying, oh, you have a statistical bias, you too. And at the end, uh, it probably works to give some antibiotics. Maybe the future will be some probiotics instead of antibiotics. Uh, but it seems to uh, manage to control the microbiota first would help in the, in the beginning or uh, in the restarting of the metabolism of the kid. Uh, but we don't know exactly how to do it without causing a, a, a massive resistance to antibiotics. Uh, in the um, transition, then we give the plumpy nut orally. The plumpy nuts are, are, are normally taste like a peanut butter, a, a little bit sweeter. So we increase normally from 130 calorie, kilocalories per kilo per day to 200. Uh, and normally it's two to six weeks, depending on the kid. The complications can be of the malnutrition. I'm not going to go so in details. You can have everything you want. They, these kids have everything you see, severe anemia, severe pneumonia, severe malaria. Oh, I'm going to point out that they have other things but that we have just no idea because we don't measure them. Most of the severe, like recently we've seen, for example, we were, t we were testing some of the uh, clinically seeing very, very or neurological deficiencies. We were giving time in, and some, what we call that, they were like heart failure, uh, they were just improving in 12 hours. 
of, of uh, our acute flaccid paralysis, they were improving in less than 24 hours. So they were having acute nutritional deficiencies and they were not having other things. Or, or also, you would have hyponatremia, uh, hypokalemia, you ha acidosis that looks like severe respiratory distress. I mean, you have other things that because we don't have electrolyte measurements, we don't have the ability to measure, when you, 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 you would think that they only have uh, infection uh, problems, but probably they have many, many other things. Um, and now that we're going deeper, uh, we're discovering them. For example, uh, just on that part, we're seeing in, in uh, East Africa a lot of uh, cetoacidotic diabetes, diabetes type 1 in the malnourished and uh, at very, very high rates, and they always come like in septic shock. But actually, you measure the, the, the ketones in the urine and the blood sugar, you would have a diagnosis of cetoacidosis. Uh, a lot of consequences give you that to you. Um, so the idea is to, uh, to go then quickly to the ambulatory system. <coughs> uh, in the ambulatory feeding centers, the mothers only come uh, for their meals. They receive some medical treatment. They are checked up. If they're very sick, they are sent to the hospital. Uh, right now, the follow-up was, first it was daily in the ambulatory because we were very scared that we were going to die. Then we said, okay, we can trust the mother. They come. So we said, okay, let's make them come twice a week. Okay, they, they come. Okay, let's make them come once a week. And now we're trying to make them come every two weeks or every month. Uh, because actually, if you explain what you're doing and they, they got it, so they can, and they can go home. We never trusted them because they were going to sell the plumping out, so we asked them to bring back the satches of plumping out cut so they don't sell it in the market. There's a lot of mistrust on that. And uh, it is still happening, even if you make them come every day, that if they have three kids and they have the plumping out, they're going to try to, to give it to the others. I mean, that's for sure. So you always give a little bit more. Uh, this is a classic uh, growth curve from a child. Uh, this is the weight uh, and uh, the time after admission in days. And this is his weight curve. Do you, would you have any idea why the, the child lost weight in the first days? You know, he was admitted, and then he started gaining weight a little bit, and then he crashes, and then he started gaining weight again. Yes, that's what he had on this, ca on this case. Either he could have a, a diarrhea and he was dehydrated, but in this case, he, he uh, arrived with quash. Uh, normally, they have um, a big loss of weight in the first days. You need to monitor because uh, marasmus have around 70% of the total body fluids of a normal kid, and the quash, 10% lower even, 60 to 70%. So they are dehydrated. They look puffy, but they are dehydrated. So it's kind of worrisome when they're losing their edema. You also you, you're not in a child that you need to restrict their fluid intake. They're going to lose their edema, but you need to keep on giving them fluids so they don't dehydrate. So it's kind of complicated. Uh, this is a classic system. You would have, a, let's say, a hospital where you would take the, the very severe, and you would have several ambulatory. We're going to go see that in the second phase better. Uh, Differences, you will see these acronyms in many organizations. ITFC is inpatient, therapeutic feeding centers, and ATFC, ambulatory feeding center. Uh, the ITFC has a lot of challenges because normally it's only covering the people that arrive. They arrive late. You require a lot of staff, nurses, nutritional assistants. There's a lot of cross-infection. This doesn't look like the ICU we saw yesterday of Rainbow, no? Where they have every patient, their own, uh, their, own uh, their own bed, and then extra doors to protect them. Doesn't look like that. Uh, I'll yeah, exactly, exactly. In terms of cross-infection, and actually they're, 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 a mother goes to do the laundry, so she takes her kids, he gives it to the neighbor, and she goes to do the laundry. And that happens all the time. And, and, and and it's super nice what they're doing, but in terms of infection control, not very good. Uh, the burden on the family and on the mother is very heavy. Uh, normally, it's the father that comes to complain that the mother is not cooking and the mother is not doing all the things that she has to do, so she needs to go back. You need, you need to explain. 
Uh, so when the ready to use food appears, it was a high innovation, you know, all these energy dense nutrients with all the fatty acids, uh, the protein based mostly on milk and all the vitamins and minerals. Now we're just checking that the, con the, the ratios that were, are not uh, accurate and they're free, they were free of water. So it was good for the bacterial growth. Uh, and the idea was to treat according to clinical condition. If they don't have any medical complications, they, they, they stay as outpatients. And uh, the idea is to bring all the management to the community, not to take all these kids back to the hospital. Diagnose early, less medical complicated cases. Uh, you would agree that that sounds logical, but actually if you could be more logical if you prevent it. If you go on, on steps before, it would see it on the, on the different uh, type of programs. So these are the big key changes. We have shifted from hospital treatment to home base to increase coverage, acceptability, and cost efficiency. And the treatments are more accessible for patients and for the providers. And uh, we're going to community management of acute malnutrition. The idea is to explain them how to identify it early, the symptoms that they have. We give them all the MUAC so they can do it and we need to decentralize, and this is the idea, to decentralize as much as possible uh, to the lower level of, of the health system. Um, this is the end of the first part.